Good morning, church. I want to say again, we are so grateful to be the pastors here at Mount Bethel Baptist Church. We love you guys. We thank God every day for you. I read an article. I'm a news junkie, so I, I read articles. I read the news. I try to stay up with current events. It helps me communicate in a more timely way to you guys what I believe God wants me to, to share with you. But I've noticed that in the news, not everybody who, who brings about information is an expert. It seems as whether, whether it's in the news media and television or radio or internet articles or Facebook or YouTube or even in the print media today, that not everybody tells the truth. There you go. It, 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 it may come as a surprise to you that some people do it unintentionally and others do it quite intentionally. They're not even trying to tell you the truth. They're not, it's not that they're just not experts and they, they are just sharing their opinion. They share the information, this so-called news, all too often in a blatant attempt to spread an untruth. Lies. Now, I've been made aware that there is, there is fake news, there is real news, there's good news, and then today I was told that there's also cute news. <laughs> you have to check with her about that. Sometimes people can chew, uh, confuse what is truth and what is not. Like what is real news and what is the fake news. Fake news is not a new thing. Fake news is a report that's not based in fact. It's intended to cast doubt deflect blame or promote untruths. People have been spreading fake news as a report well since the Garden of Eden. You remember Adam said it was her fault. Eve said it was his fault. The devil said it's not my fault. People have been spreading false news, fake news since throughout history. It seems as though many people subscribe to the same ideology of that of an infamous character in history who was quoted to have said, if you tell a big lie frequently enough, it will be believed. Adolf Hitler said that. The problem with this kind of ideology is that it's further compounded when people begin to subscribe to that kind of ideology that to do whatever is necessary to maintain such a lie is also justified. One of Adolf Hitler's top aides said, if you tell a lie, a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political economic and or military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent. For the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie and thus by extension the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. My mic just went out. Joseph Goebbels said that here it lies all pun intended, the problem with this kind of ideology, philosophy, and sadly, theology. If you don't know what to believe, you're inclined to believe a big lie told loud enough, long enough to believe it. Amen? Amen. If you don't know what to believe, and you're inclined to believe a big lie told loud enough, long enough. Is my mic not on? Now. Now. Work, is it working now? All right, we're working now. I just put new batteries in. Thank you. I appreciate your help. If you don't know what to believe, you're inclined to believe a big lie told loud enough, long enough. And soon the only way to maintain that belief is to add further lies to it. The problem is, is that people tell untruths, little white lies, partial truths, or flat out lies all the time. And it weaves its way even into the church, even into our doctrinal theories and our philosophies and our theologies. I 
spoke with a young pastor just recently and he shared with me his heart was heavy over the fact that he heard a pastor speaking from the pulpit a theology that was all wrong. He was leading 200 plus people in the congregation to believe that evangelism is unnecessary. That in fact, there was no reason to reach out to people in the community, young or old, because after all, God who is all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present, knows who's going to be saved, so they'll find their way to the church. Let me say this to you. That is an evil that has been repeated throughout human history in the church. And it's referred to as hyper-Calvinism. That's a purporting of there's folks who are going to be saved. And then there's folks who are just going to be damned to hell. And God knows who they are. And so he's going to allow those who are going to make their way into the church and be saved. To come in. And we don't have to do anything. Let me tell you that's an outright lie. Amen? God knows all this, but we don't. So we have to cast the net as he's told us to do so. Amen? Amen? We're supposed to go out and share the gospel. The Great Commission tells us that. We are to complete the work that he's given us. For us to sit in these four walls and say, well, God will send them in here when he wants to. That's wrong. If you're with me, say amen. amen. But that's happening. And so you've got people who are sitting in a church saying, well, this is a pastor. He's got this theological training. He's the one who reads the word of God. He's the one who's got the position. He must know what he's talking about. So I no longer have to feel the pressure of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ or sharing the message with anybody or even praying for anybody. Because after all, God knows and he'll bring them in. Can I tell you that the days of the marquee sitting out in front of the church with the message on it for this coming Sunday message is not the only means that we can reach people anymore? It used to be that the church used to be the center of the community. It used to be that the church was not only the center of the community, but the place that was highly respected. The place where people felt a sense of community and belonging, but also the, the place where they knew they could find truth. Amen? Amen. Because now I've told you, People have been sharing untruths and outright lies since the Garden of Eden. But the one place that people ought to be able to come with absolute confidence is the church when they want to hear the truth. Amen? Amen. But when a man of God, scratch that, someone who stands in the pulpit professes to speak and preach the word of God and does not do so properly, he's doing an injustice. So I want you to know what the truths are. Because it's so easy for us being inundated constantly with lies to fall for something that is not the truth. I want to tell you that I've been thinking about this message for some time. And I've decided that you can stand for something or you can fall for anything. But there's something about just standing for something. You got to know what you're standing for. You got to stand for what matters. Amen? Amen. I want to tell you today that anyone who is here and everyone who will listen to this message online, I am not nor have I ever been a fascist, a racist, a misogynist, a sexist, a homophobe, a xenophobe, a hate monger in any way. Sadly, many who call themselves believers align themselves more with these ideologies, philosophies, and theologies than they do with God's Word. Largely, I believe because their worldview, that is their paradigm, the way that they look at the world and others and themselves and life in general, is filtered through a lens of fear and not through a lens of love, as in God's Word. Amen? Amen. Now, I recognize there are some who are sitting here today who are saying, Oh, but pastor, God's word says to hate the world. Yes, it does. Hate the things of this world. 
But you flip a few chapters over, a few books over, and you see that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Amen? Amen. So please hear the difference. God hates the evil in the world, the things that have come and distorted because of sin. But he desperately loves the world. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ who desires to love God and worship him with my whole life, with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and others as well. To be clear, as a believer in Jesus Christ, he's my Savior, he's my Lord. I believe that each person should be judged on the merit of their character, their demonstrated work ethic, and their demonstrated faith in Christ as they follow the God of the Bible. His word and the leading of his Holy Spirit, working together with like-minded believers in fellowship and accountability. My faith demands that I obey the teachings of God's word, the leading of God's Holy Spirit, and show respect to everyone, regardless of whether or not they believe as I do, or even agree with my right to believe as I do. I am called to love God and love others. That's what I believe. And you may be thinking, Pastor, we already know this about you. You're our pastor. But it's important for me to share this with you because we live in a world today where people are going to extremes. They find themselves polarized. And these camps are refusing to honor each other and respect each other's diversity and the right to disagree. Show me where in Scripture Jesus treated others that way. Do you know that the harshest words that Jesus ever uttered in Scripture were for those who purported themselves to be the religious elite? Amen. Not for those who were the furthest from him. Mm. It's important for us today. In today's world, we... It's really hard for us to know what to believe in, what to stand for, and what not to fall for. We need a truth we can cling to in such times. We have people with varying degrees of education, experience, and expertise all vying for this influence in our lives. Some have considerable influence from the support of the media, the television, the radio, the internet, and others not so. They have just a platform in friendship, at work, or at school, or as parents, or extended family, or friends. But these influences nonetheless have the opportunity to speak life and hope and help and healing, truth into our lives. Or to do just the opposite. Each of us has the same opportunity to speak into others' lives. Hope, help, and healing, life, love, truth or to do just the opposite each of us has our own presuppositions our own biases our own prejudices and our own preconceived ideas bent towards or against what we would prefer or what we dislike what doesn't favor us all of this goes into the mix of creating our own paradigm ideologies a set of shared beliefs within a group Philosophies, the way one chooses to view reality, the existence or knowledge or values or themselves and others. Theology, how one forms an opinion about the existence of and the nature of God. All of these three things come together to help us create an understanding of truth. But on what to base our ideologies, our philosophies and theologies that's the question. Where do we hang? Where do we hang our this is truth? Not everyone knows what they believe or why they believe it. Take the case that the pastor entered a class as the lesson was in progress and asked, who broke down the walls of Jericho? A well, young man answered, not me, sir. <laughs> Pastor turned to the teacher and, and asked, is this the usual behavior of this class? The teacher replied, I believe this boy is an honest boy and I really don't think he did it. 
Leaving the room, the pastor sought out a deacon and explained what happened. The deacon said, I've known both the, both the boy and the teacher for several years and neither of them would have done such a thing. By this time, the pastor was heart sick and reported the incident to the Christian Education Committee. They said, Pastor, we see no point in making an issue out of this thing. Let's just pay the bill for the damage to the walls and charge it to upkeep. <laughs> oh, man. It's important to know what to believe. Why you believe it. So that you can live it out. You have to stand for something or you'll fall for anything. Some people, however, think that they can find what they're looking for in all the wrong places. They think they can look for truth anywhere in hopes of finding the answers to those really big questions in life. There's a story of a man walking down the street one night and he sees a man crawling around on the ground beneath a lamppost. What are you looking for? The man asked the man on his knees frantically looking around. I'm looking for my house keys, the man says. I lost them around here. Well, I'll help you, the man says. Together they begin to look on all fours under the street light. But after several minutes, neither of them can find the keys. Are you sure this is where you lost the keys? The man asks. No, I'm not sure of that at all, the agitated man says. I might have lost them in the alley. Then why are you looking here and not in the alley? Well, this is where the light is. That's the way we act at times. That's the way our world acts at times. For us to argue that we're seeking truth, but not including God's word, the real light, is to not be making a genuine search for truth. Amen? Amen. We find truth in God's word. God's one and only Son, the incarnate word of God. And in the leading of the Holy Spirit who tells us he will lead us and guide us in all truth. It's the most important thing for us to know. What we stand for. So that we will not fall for anything. Please stand with me this morning in honor of reading God's word. Coming out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance persecutions and sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures. Which are able to make you wise for salvation. Through faith in Christ Jesus. 
All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Let's pray. God, these are our perilous times. These are times of great uncertainty. Times of trial and trouble and testing for your people. Times where we have to discern what is right, what is wrong, what is truth from lie. And I pray to our Father that this morning you would open our blinded eyes that we might see our ears, that we might hear our dull minds, that we might grasp and our hardened hearts, that we might finally be receptive to the truth, the absolute truth, the word of God, which is truth. For we ask this in the precious name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. you may be seated. You would be correct if you picked up that we're right in the middle of Paul's second letter to his young protege, Timothy. In fact, Timothy uh, was the Apostle Paul's mentor or, or mentee in the faith. And he was now preparing to pass on this mantle of ministry to Timothy. He wants to show him in this letter some important things to watch out for. Some will love themselves rather than God. Some will have the form of godliness but deny its power. Some will be always learning but never able to come to the truth. Some will always be opposing the truth. And some will know the truth. But all, all who call themselves Christians will be persecuted for living a godly life. So what do you do, Timothy? Well, here it is. You must continue in what you've learned. What you've become convinced of. Because you know whom you've learned it. You must remember the Holy Scriptures which are making you wise for salvation through Christ Jesus. Because all Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So that the servant of God, you Timothy will be ready and able to be equipped for all good works. So what are the things of the faith that Paul had taught Timothy? What are these things of the faith that Timothy had been convinced of? What is it that Timothy had heard and seen and learned from the others around him? What is it that the Apostle Paul, Timothy, wanted Timothy to remember, to hang on to, not depart from or abandon? It's these things, the fundamentals of the faith. The fundamentals of the faith. We call them the fundamentals of the faith, the five fundamentals of the faith, because they are the essence of the Christian religion. I'm not talking about Baptist faith. I'm not talking about Calvinism or Arminianism. I'm not talking about just basic anywhere on the spectrum of, of denominational philosophies, theologies. No, I'll get to that next. This is fundamentals of the faith. These are the five things fundamental to the Christian faith which everyone, these five tenets who call themselves a believer in Jesus Christ must believe in and adhere to. The deity of our Lord Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, the sacrificial blood atonement, the bodily resurrection, and the inerrancy of scriptures. These are the five things. Now let me say it to you this way. It's important for us to remember that there is a theological landscape, Calvinism to Arminianism, as I've shared with you earlier. But what you need to know is that everyone who calls themselves a Christian, that's the overarching title, label, identifier for all of us. I shared with you several weeks ago that when somebody asked me who I am, I said, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, a God follower, a God of the Bible. Amen? Amen. And then I say, and then I'm a Baptist. Now, it's important for us to remember this because you see, if your first identifier is your denomination and your denomination takes a left turn when you're trying to do right things as we've seen happen in recent years, then what do you do? Amen? I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, a God follower, first. Then I'm a Baptist. 
But before I get to Baptist, I've got to nail down these five tenets of the faith. I've got to know that I believe in these things. Because to try to play where I can pull one of them out and say, well, I don't really know about that. If I play that, pull one out, it's a little like pulling the, the, the what do you call it, the thread out of a sweater. I tried to do that once. It didn't work out too well. There's a game the kids play. You take these little pieces of wood and you stack them. You know, and you try to build a little tower up and then you try to pull, pull a piece up. What's it called? Jenga. Jenga. You've seen that, right? You can only pull out one or two and maybe, maybe not even the one because the way, depending on the way things have been structured, it, the whole thing will fall apart. Christian faith. These five fundamentals of the faith, you have to have them all. This is the important part of where you start to hang your truth. What you're willing to stand for. Because you see, the world's going to constantly come at you with, yeah, but really? Can you really believe the virgin birth? Can you really believe the sinless life? Can you really believe the sacrificial atoning death? Can you really believe the resurrection? Can you really believe the inerrancy and inspiration and infallibility of scripture? Think about just in the last few years how you've heard every one of those five tenets being attacked. You have to know what you know you're standing for or you'll fall for anything. Amen? Amen. Five fundamentals of the faith. But that's not all. These are referred to as by theologians, it's first-tier theologies. This is what distinguishes a believer from an unbeliever. But there are also second-tier theological issues, concepts like eschatology. These are end times things, Bible versions, eternal security versus conditional security, methods of baptism, methods of the Lord's Supper, washing feet or not. These are what constitute denominational and theological differences in interpretations of Scripture. These are second-tier theology. Folks, neither of these things in the second-tier theology are going to be a make-or-break brother or sister in Christ. Amen? Amen. Then there are third-tier theology issues, which amount to little more than interdenominational things, distinguishing between General Baptist, Southern Baptist, you know. You don't get into arguments with folks about that, do you? No. You've heard me say when we practice the Lord's Supper, that we practice open communion, Lord's Supper. That means if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you happen to be visiting with us, you are free to partake. This is not a closed group where only our church members can partake. The one prerequisite is that you are a believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now returning to the first tier theological matters of importance, these five basic doctrines, they're absolutes. You cannot say, I'll take one and not the other. We believe that there are many, many Christians today from varied backgrounds and denominations who fully believe and teach the five core doctrines of the faith, the tenets of the faith I've just outlined for you. These doctrines permeate their teachings at every level. We must be respectful and loving of them. Whether we agree with their doctrines on the theological spectrum or not. Amen? Amen? Just recently, back in April, we went to a Celebrate Recovery uh, training program down in uh, Washington, D.C. We were at a, what shall we say, uh, a uh, Church of Christ in God. Pentecostal church. When the pastor and his co-pastor were up there, they began to speak in tongues. As they were praying. So did I. Mine just happens to be English. I'm not going to be condemning of them. That's between God and them. Amen? Amen. I'm there to worship God. I'm there to train. I'm going to bring back what I believe to be truth. It's important for us to know we can have fellowship with each other. So long as sin does not reign. Amen? 
If someone presents themselves to be a born again believer in Jesus Christ, yet does not hold to these tenets of the truth, they are in reality apostates, unbelievers. Our text today is important because it reminds us that the word of God is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We have a responsibility as fellow believers when someone within our fold begins to say something that is incorrect or a brother or sister that we know and have a relationship with to say, let me show you this. Let's talk about this so we can get back to truth. The problem the problem is, is we don't do that. Apostle Paul preached salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. And that he was raised for new life for us. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. 1 Corinthians 15 1 through 11 says. These five tenets or fundamental faiths are important to us. And they're so simple that even a child can understand them and believe in their heart that is the truth. If you ask a young child who the three persons of the Godhead or the Trinity are, they may not understand exactly what you're saying. But if you can ask them, who is God? Well, they'll tell you if they've been exposed to Sunday school. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you ask them whether Jesus was just a man or if he was God, he'll probably tell you he was both. Good. If you ask the child, what does it mean to be saved? They'll tell you, believe in Jesus. If you ask him why the Bible is so important, he would say because it's God's word. If you ask him why it's so important for us to live like Jesus... He tell you it's because it's important to love God and love others just like Jesus did. If you ask a very young child who's been taught the basics of the gospel, they know the truth. We too must come to a place where we continue in growth and teaching of the truth. There are many Christian doctrines, but the five fundamentals of the faith are absolute. Amen? Amen? But there's more, Paul writes. Second, the fight for the faith. If a person, a group, a movement, a cult, or a religion is teaching anything that goes against or undermines these five doctrines, the word of God stands against them. And true Christians are to rebuke them. If they claim to be Christians. Let me, I just told somebody just this week, we were talking about behavior. And I made the comment to them, does it surprise you that an unbeliever acts in an unbelieving way? It shouldn't. No more than if you walk up to a strange dog and he bites you. You know the old joke. Does your dog bite? No. Pest the dog, the dog bites him. That's not my dog. <laughs> Unbelievers are going to act like unbelievers. They're not going to value the word of God. They're not going to hold in respect the presence of the relationship within a believer that God has. They can't. It's foolishness to them. God's word tells us that. But we have responsibility to not only hold to the fundamentals of the faith, but also to fight for the faith. To take a stand for what matters. We consider everyone with respect. 1 Peter 3 tells us, Be ready always to give a reason for the hope that is within you. But do so gently with respect. Amen? Amen. The problem is, even within our own church, we don't want to approach people who, who lead with false teaching. Have a an incorrect understanding of Scripture. People who are not in right relationship with God should be confronted gently with the attitude of restoring that one to right relationship. Scripture makes it clear 
that we go to that person in love privately, then, if not received, corporately. If not received, the church has an obligation to break fellowship with that one. It's not to mean or degrade. It's meant to restore the person in love so that they will miss that fellowship and want to be back in it again. But the church doesn't do this today. Instead, it allows for such to continue and we wonder why sin proliferates within the ranks of the church, why apostasy has taken hold and why false teachers have ascended to positions of prominence and why so many are being led astray. This is why. Because we live in a world that says it's not right for you to be condemning of me. It's not right for you to be so critical of me. It's not right for you to be intolerant of what I believe. But it's right for them to be critical and intolerant of us who speak truth. But you have to stand for what matters or you'll fall for anything. Remember, we live in a culture where you say something loud enough, long enough, people will begin it to believe it. I saw in the news this week that Ireland is now passing out brochures considering the preaching and teaching of the gospel, proselytizing, to be considered hate speech. We laugh. But we stand in the threshold of very, very perilous times. I fully expect if I live long enough, and fill a pulpit long enough, I will be arrested for preaching hate speech. I'm okay with that. If you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. You got to know what to stand for, what you hold to be truth. That gives me the third thing we're coming to today. The foundations of the truth in the faith. Absolute truth is that truth which is right. For all people in all places at all times. Is there any evidence of the existence of absolute truth? The answer to that is yes. First there is God's word. God's one and only son. The incarnate word of truth. And the Holy Spirit who testifies to that truth. God is the originator of truth. The author of truth. The embodiment of truth. In God there is no deceit. For God is truth. Absolute truth by extension. Then we can believe that all God says and does is truth. If we're to seek absolute truth, we must seek God. We must seek and accept God's word as absolute truth. And then God's Son is the embodiment of that truth. And God's Holy Spirit as the guide to all truth. To do the opposite of that is not to accept truth. Second, there is human conscience. The certain something within us all that tells us that the world was created in a certain way that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Our conscience convinces us that something wrong uh, is, or there is something wrong with suffering and starvation, rape and pain and evil. And it makes us aware that love and generosity and compassion and peace are positive things with which we should strive. It's amazing to me that we all know the difference between right and wrong. I remember years ago, I remember years ago hearing a complaint about a person who was calling in. Somebody had come in and burglarized some property from his house. When the officer responded, said, well, what is it that you got? Well, it was a bunch of stuff I had over here, a bunch of electronic stuff, and I had it all stacked up right here. Well, do you have any uh, receipts or or serial numbers or anything? No, because I had just stolen it from another house we'd burglarized. (laughs) All righty then. Or the guy who calls just recently to, to complain that somebody stole his drugs. Okay? Got it. You see, the thing about it is, is we intuitively know right from wrong. Even when we don't do right. We know. Thirdly, there's the universe. The whole of the universe and all of creation tells us that there is an intelligent design, that there is something more to this by, than happenstance, and that it didn't just all come together as some cosmic ooze. No. We didn't crawl out of anything but a fallen sinful nature. Amen? Amen. The 
third evidence for existence is the absolute truth in science. Science is simply the pursuit of knowledge and the study of what we know and the quest to know more. All science is the study for truth. I was speaking with a young man who's a scientist and I shared with him that my conversation with my youngest son in, in search of truth was just that. If you're going to put some research together and pursue science, a scientific research on truth, then you have to include everything. Because to intentionally exclude something that purports to be the truth means that your thesis can only be one or two things. Either there is none or there is some. Amen? Amen. If you start with the bias that there is no truth and you exclude God's word, okay, well, you're not going to find truth. If you start with the bias that there is truth and you exclude God's word and you come up with I've not found it, then you've not had a legitimate research. I did a 400 page research process, uh, process for my, my doctorate. I had to start with a thesis statement and then I had to set about either proving it or disproving it. We have a couple of others in this, in this uh, area here who have uh, doctorates as well who've done the same thing. They know what I'm talking about. You can't just exclude something because it didn't prove your thesis. Isn't that correct? And if you get all the way through your research and you find something that didn't agree with your, your thesis statement, then you can only conclude honestly that my thesis was wrong. Amen? We don't do that with truth though. You see, we decided that there's another truth. And that's relative truth. That's truth that's relative to me at, at this moment, at this time, with what I want it to be. That's not relative truth. That's not anything. This might be relative, but it's not truth. Truth is that which is right for all people at all times, in all places. Anything other than that ain't the truth. Fourth evidence for this evidence of truth Existence of absolute truth is religion. All of the religions of the world attempt to give meaning and definition of life. They are born out of mankind's desire for something more than simple existence. Through religion, humans seek God, hope for future, forgiveness of sins, peace in the midst of struggle, and answers to our deepest questions. Religion is really evidence that mankind is more than just a highly evolved animal. It is the evidence of a higher purpose and of the existence of a personal and purposeful creator who implanted in man the desire to know him and to be known. Fortunately for us, there is such a God. There is such a creator. He has revealed his truth in his word and he's given us not only the revelation of himself to us, but he's also allowed that word to allow it to reveal ourselves to us. Our greatest lie is to ourselves that we can be, we are, more than what we really are. I can look in the mirror a hundred times a day and say, I, I look better than George Clooney. But the truth is, I look more like Brad Pitt. The fact that absolute trust, uh, truth does exist points us to a truth that these things we've looked at today are absolutely important for us. You see, when we look at the fundamentals of the faith, the fight for the faith and the foundations, foundations of truth in the faith, we can recognize that it's there we can hang our hats on and say, that is truth. That is what we can stand for. That's what we know matters. I'm not talking about politics today. Whether you're Republican, Democrat, or Green Party, or Liberal, I could care less. What I do care about is where you hang your head in truth. Because see, truth transcends politics, ideologies, and philosophies, and theologies. Truth transcends all of that. Because truth is about real relationship with a real God and a real Savior who cares about a real person who's got real sin issues and has a real life to deal with. Amen. That's my God. When everybody else backs away from what they said a week ago, two days ago, a month ago, a year ago, based on relative truth, 
my God stands firmly on absolute truth. And I can stand on his absolute truth with this absolute truth. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior, and he is. Amen. How about you? Do you want to know the truth? Do you want to know the truth of God's word? Do you want to hear and know when lies are being shared so that you can say that's not true? Do you want to know how to determine truth from lie? Then here's what you got to do. Write it down. Got to get in God's word. You got to learn God's word. You got to meditate on God's word. You got to obey God's word. And you got to be a doer of God's word. That's what it takes. And then you can stand up and say, No. This is what matters. I'm taking a stand for what matters. Hey, folks are filling the streets for protesting this and that. Isn't it time for Christians, real believers, to rise up and stand for what matters? Where God has put you? I think so. This morning, we're going to move into the Lord's Supper. I want you to think about this sermon. Be a person who stands for Christ. A person who knows what matters. What they believe in and why they believe it. And then when you do, fall on your knees in praise and prayer before the Lord. Thank Him for being your source of truth. As we move into the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11, 23 and 32. For I received from the Lord Himself that instruction which I passed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night in which He was betrayed and took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This represents my body, which is offered as a sacrifice for you. Do this in affectionate remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in affectionate remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are symbolically proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes again. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy of him will be guilty of profaning and sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. But a person must prayerfully examine himself and his relationship to Christ and only when he has done so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without solemn reverence and heartfelt gratitude for the sacrifice of Christ eats and drinks a judgment on himself if he does not recognize the body of Christ. A careless and unworthy participation is the reason why many among you are weak and sick and a number sleep in death. But if we evaluated ourselves and judged ourselves honestly, recognizing our shortcomings and correcting our behavior, we would not be judged. But when we fall short and are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined by undergoing His correction so that we will not be condemned to eternal punishment along with the world. Let's pray. Gentlemen, if you'll stand, come with, come forward. Father God, we come before you this morning in this solemn time. And we pray, Father, that you would help us be mindful of who we are, what we're called to be and do. We're called to be called out, separated from the world. Not to be like the world, but to be in the world to make a difference. That means we have to rise up, stand up for what matters. Let our lives first and foremost privately with you, Lord, reflect that attitude as we examine ourselves today in the light of your word as we partake of the Lord's Supper.
when he had given thanks, he took the bread and broke it. He said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take it in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, ratified and established in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in affectionate remembrance of me. Thank you. To church, stand with me. we leave this place we go on mission when we leave this place proclaim boldly the truth who you are and who you serve and the God of all truth will be with you listen to the words of this song 